Welcome Hello. to the fifteenth episode of Redeeming the Time. I'm your host Jake Wells. This is my dad Keith it's Wells? The time now, huh? <laughs> yeah, it is. All right. Uh, I am hyper today, okay. so very good. If I don't make sense, <laughs> or if I'm talking a million miles per hour, that's why. Okay. But thanks for joining us. You can find us on all major platforms. You can contact us at Redeeming the Time Pod at Gmail dot com. And I want to get the elephant out of the room right off the rip. Kentucky stinks. Yes, they do. I'm very upset. Yes, they do. It was a terrible game. Tough to watch. Reed Shepard didn't show up. Yeah. Move on. <laughs> His trade stock went down quite a bit. Yeah. They they still think that he's going to go like third. Really? The, well, the the Spurs need a shooting, shooter. Oh, okay. So. Well, and when you have 3,000 games a, a year like the NBA, yeah. there's not a lot of pressure. Cause he shot 52% from three this year. What did he shoot? Fifty-two percent. What did he shoot in the? He went one for three. He only shot three times. Wow. Yeah. Now tell the stats of that guy that. Uh, I don't want to talk about Jack Golke. Now he. Uh, thirty-two points. Thirty-two points, two free throws. So he made ten threes. He. Uh, he shot three hundred twenty-seven threes on the year and only eight two-pointers all year, and he went four for eight, and. I'm sure some of those were like the toe was on the line. Yeah, my favorite is he dribbled four times. He dribbled four times to, to score shoot 32 points. 32 points. That's, yeah. that's, that's impressive. Insane. Nearly a record. Catch he was one shoot. away from tying the record. Uh, for that's impressive. Threes. Well, I'm not even going to talk about my team because they're, <laughs> they're I don't still wanna, in it. No, I don't want to say anything because we got to play Gonzaga tomorrow. And uh, by the time this comes out, we will have either – Fallen in defeat, and I will be in. By the time this comes out. Hopefully they're in a championship, but we'll. We'll see if they won. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, yeah we'll see. Um, or if they even get there. I hope they do, but. They look good. Uh, yep. But What's our topic today? A fun one. Yeah, I thought you had it this, okay. this time. Ah, I get to do it. All right, so here's the topic. Well, you're scrolling through the channels on TV, which nobody does anymore. They just go to whatever exact show they want to watch. But if you're going through the through the channel and a movie pops up what movie do you always stop and watch at least a little bit if not finish it finish it off mine yeah i've got several but i've got several Com- comedy pink panther okay with steve martin yeah the not the original not the original but those are great too but the the steve martin one is hilarious yep, yep. i know cool. every word to it great bunch of one liners <laughs> Uh, for action, uh, I would probably say one of the Batman movies with uh, the Nolan, Christopher the Nolan, Nolan yeah. movies. Pretty much any Nolan movie. Yeah, I love Christopher Nolan. Um, or really any of the Marvel, old Marvel. I would say like the Avengers. Any of the Avengers, I'll probably sit and watch those. Except for, except Avengers for Thor two. two, Avengers two. That's terrible. And. Uh, what was the other one? Hulk. Hulk is bad. Eternals is bad. But anything after Iron end, Man three. Anything after Endgame, you can kind of you can you can keep. All right. What about you? Uh, if Gladiator is on TV, I will always. Gladiator. I will always stop and watch that. That is just. So Are you good. not entertained? Um, I said on TV, by the way, so it's quite different in the yeah. theater. Uh, Shawshank Redemption. That's a really good one. I would stop the, t- yeah, I will always stop and watch a little bit of that. Probably any of the Lord of the Rings, any Star Wars, those those types of things. Uh, obviously, my favorite uh, would be comedy wise would probably be Ghostbusters if it's uh, the original. Yeah. So those would be the ones I'd stop and and watch. Uh, Leanne cracks up because any any show that pops up. She'll be in watching a show, and I'll walk in to talk to her, and I'm watching. I don't even know what's going on, and I, yeah. I'm i just bad if a screen's in front of me. You know, just sitting there <laughs> staring for a while. But movies-wise, that, that those those are the biggies. Yeah, and, yeah, any Christopher Nolan movies. They're so good. Yeah. I mean, They're Inception so or, or – Interstellar. What's the one you uh, – the, the one about the um, magicians – Oh, the Prestige. Uh, the Prestige. I had never seen that movie. If you haven't seen, seen that, that movie, movie, go and watch the movie. Yeah, right I don't know. 
I watched it on TV, so I don't know rating wise on the other things. But uh, man alive, it's... you have no idea until the very end what's going on. It, it's quality. Yeah, yeah the it's, only it's one, good. the only one of his, the Tenet, I didn't. It was okay. That was. It was just. I've yet to see Oppenheimer, confusing. so I don't. I've not seen that yet, so I've got to still see. Watch that. the TV version. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, let's. One move of on. these days, we gotta rank our Star Wars movies. Oh, not, okay. not today. All We're right, already passed, right. but we got to rank which one so, is our favorite and stuff. And all those that aren't nerds are going to be like, we don't care. I don't, that's who we are. Yeah. All, right, all right. So today we got Second Samuel thirteen. Yes. Through First Kings seven. Yeah. This so is, we're going to finish up the Samuels and get into the Kings. Yeah, so like I said last week, you know, this is like watch, binge watching the life of David, and now we have David as fully established king. Uh, Monday, we're 13 through 14, 13 through 15. What are we? We are thir- th- 13 through 15. Okay. So. so we start once again. <laughs> hey, just like we warned you last week, if you've got little kids, be careful in this chapter. We pick uh, great chapters to start on. Well, we don't pick them. I mean, it's just how it is. And we have, uh, we have David's oldest son here, Amnon. And as I've heard, I heard a sermon years ago. Amnon had a friend. Yeah. This guy turned friend into a three-syllable word. Friend. Friend. And his name was Jonadab. And so Jonadab's his cousin. Uh, Amnon's got a crush on his half sister. Gross. Apparently, she, she some of that we yeah. re- we've already read. Uh, you know that that kind of thing goes on. It's Absalom's sister, half sister to Tamar, and Jonadab calls him a subtle man. Uh, the anytime you've heard me teach on this, I always mention this: the serpent in Genesis is called subtle. The strange woman in Proverbs is called subtle, and he is called subtle. Not good. Yeah, not that's not good a good adjective. Crowd to be with, but that's who he is. Uh, and he gives Amnon this plot, and he winds up raping his sister, yeah. his half sister. And she's like, you know, if you go to dad, he's probably more than willing to let you marry me. And she doesn't. And it says in verse 15, afterward, he hated her as much as. He had loved her before. More than loved. he loved yeah, her. More. Yeah. So this is completely selfish. It's just lust, and there's no love there. And I guess the thing, you know, sin blinds, and it destroys. And this is going to be, we see from the sin of Bathsheba, with David with Bathsheba, uh, we now see this progression that's going to go on. Yeah. And so she puts ashes on her head and yeah. mourning and, and shame, right? Mm-hmm. And then you get into David's response here, and he does. He was he was mad, but he doesn't do anything about it. Yeah, he's very wroth. It says, but he he doesn't he doesn't do anything. And for two full years, it says two full years, and then Absalom comes into the picture. Yeah, and he tries to take it into his own hands. So it's Absalom's full sister. And go ahead, you can. Yeah. So. Uh, Absalom takes matters into his own ha- into his own hands and uh, imp- tricks his dad. Tricks his dad, and he goes and he s- kills Amnon or his his men. Yeah, so he, he acts like we're gonna go shear the sheep. We're gonna have this big party. You guys come along, and David says, "No, no, 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 I won't go." But all his brothers go, and Amnon tells his buddies to to kill him. So Amnon gets. He's at this party. Looks like he's probably a little bit drunk. We don't know. So this is now the second child that he's lost. So he lost. And he remember back when Nathan comes to him, he says, you know, the fourfold. He yeah. lost the child with Bathsheba. Now he loses Amnon. And, uh, and now he's mourning for yeah. both sons now. And look who comes back in verse 32. The subtle man. John, yeah. John, yeah. And he's like... Don't be sad about Amnon's death. You, Amnon, and and it, he says, and Amnon only is dead. You still have Absalom here. Yeah, David thinks he's lost all of his kids. He thinks Absalom killed all of his sons. But this Jonadab, who set up the whole problem, he's like, no, 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 you're okay. And he's he's just weaseling his way in there. Now, Absalom leaves. This is an important point. Absalom leaves, and he goes to uh, Jeshur. At the king of Jeshur, who is his grandfather, uh, and you know, it may be that there was a little bit of bad blood between him and David, 
uh, because uh, he took his daughter. He had done an attack there. So I don't know if he took her or if he actually married her. We don't know. Uh, but either way, there might have been some bad blood there. And Absalom leaves for three years, and David does not pursue him, but is yearning for him. Yeah. So. And you see that Joab, in verse in chapter 14, he perceives that uh, David is yearning for Absalom. So yeah. he this, this is Joab's plan to get Absalom back to Jerusalem. Yeah, so he sends this old lady in, and she fakes <clears throat> this situation. And eventually, it's very similar to what Nathan had done, and... And creates a story. Yeah, it creates this this story, and then uh, it's found out that uh, he he sees through it, and he realizes what's going on. So he yeah, he says, "Did Joe put you up to this?" And she spills the beans, but still says, "Hey, why aren't you bringing bringing Absalom back?" Absalom was worthy of death, but he he doesn't do that. And Absalom returns, uh, but he's sent to his house. He's but like, "Yeah, you can come home, but I don't want to talk to you." Yeah. And so he's pretty much on house arrest for, for two about years. two years. And so he gets tired of waiting to talk to his dad. So, and he's trying to get Joab's attention, like, hey, bring me to my dad. And he, Joab, Joab doesn't re- So he does what any man would do and sets, sets Joab's field on fire yeah, to get, get his attention. attention. <laughs> so Joab, it does, yeah. and he brings him to David. Yeah. And you see at the end of here that uh, the king kissed Absalom. So right. some. So they finally, it appears they're back together. Uh, there is something in the middle of that chapter, 25 and 26, starts to show, they're setting this up, they're showing uh, Absalom's vanity. He must have been a very handsome man. With lots uh, of hair. Lots of hair. I, I did the, he, 500 pounds, five, sorry, 500, five and a half pounds of hair each year was taken off his head. This dude had a ton of hair, yeah, uh, and he had it braided and locks and all that. And stuff. We'll see that in yeah, chapter that's eighteen. Going to be his downfall. So, so go ahead. Fifteen uh, immediately after it says, and the king kissed him in fourteen at the end, and then it says uh, he prepared his chariots and fifty men to run before him. He's starting to undermine, undermine yeah. David and his in his kingdom. Yeah, this is a big deal. Um, Absalom starts to circumvent the people co- going to the king. So the people are going for judgment to the king, and he stands in the gate. Uh, yeah, all the things that you said to make himself look all great, but then he's handsome, he's well-spoken. Charismatic. Yeah, and, he, and he, so he stands in the gate, and he starts to, it says, steal the heart of the people. So he's got image, he's in the right location. Uh, look who he picks the people that are troubled. Yeah. Uh, he feigns interest in them. Well, what city? Almost like are, a cult. He's like, what city are you from? Oh yeah. Oh, I wish you had some rulers in your city that. And then he says, you know, if I was in charge, he doesn't slam his dad. But if, when if I was in charge, I would do this. And he basically is stealing the hearts of the people. And uh, I see that you. S- you still see that today. That's that's a major politician move. You'll see it in churches sometimes, uh, where we have to be very careful as staff members in church. Well, uh, you know, when Brother Gary was here or when Brother Preston was here, you can, you might think something different than your than the the senior pastor. Some of those things you need to keep to yourself because you are acting to where you're trying to steal their hearts. Yeah. And here, they're trying to steal the hearts of the king. So Absalom lies to David once again, and, he's, and he says he's got to go. He's made some vow, and he has to go do that. And he takes 200 men with him, and they're plotting this insurrection. The big deal is Bathsheba's grandfather, Ahithophel, who was David's counselor, goes with Absalom. Yeah, and uh, this was a pretty big deal apparently, with for David. Oh, well, for Ahithophel. Yeah, that yeah. Ahithophel went with because from here on out you see that this like David cared a lot about Ahithophel going with him. Yeah. So verses thirteen through thirty-seven. I mean, I've got a whole page on this this chapter. Um, <laughs> he flees the city for his life. Yeah. Uh, he's got his family. He's got his court. Uh, he leaves ten concubines behind to keep the house. 
His mighty men follow him, verse 18. Um, and then he sends spies. Yeah. Well, he's, you know, here's an older king, and now we see he's being nagged with, that's probably not, it's a light word, with the consequences of his sin. Um, and the people, the people see this, and their hearts have been stolen away. They see him weakening as an older king, and... People love change, uh, even if things are going great. I mean, we've you know you can have prosperous years in America, and if uh, if you can drum up enough, uh, if this could be better type stuff, and we still vote for some Yahoo to go in where we could have kept it great, you know that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm not talking about any. Yeah, we're not. Doing I'm that. talking <laughs> just in general. All right, so don't do not read into that. Um, so. We get to verses 19 through 22, and David's friend, uh, Atai, uh, this guy has been new to the land, and he he shows great loyalty. Oh, I had a quote here. Remember, the more rebels there are, the more need for us to, conspic- to conspicuously show loyalty to our king. So uh, if, if you're dealing with a loyalty issue in life, the more... Uh, threats there are, the more you need to show loyalty to, to, to the leaders in your life, whatever area of life that might be. Mm-hmm. And he does that. He's, yeah, he does. Yeah. His actual name means with me. Hmm. That's pretty cool. A tie. Um, he's loyal when David's down. He's loyal decisively. He's loyal voluntarily. He's loyal publicly. He's loyal knowing that whatever David's end is going to be his end as well. That's cool. That's mm-hmm. very cool. So David somewhat submits to his chastening, and uh, yeah, he then, does. And then he—he's—I mean, he's tearful and all that. And then he goes and he sends uh, Hushai, Abiathar, a, a <laughs> and, and Zadok, the priest. Yeah. So yeah. they come with the Ark of the Covenant. He's like, no, 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 no. That needs to go back because if this is God's punishment on me. The Ark of the Covenant needs to be in, yeah. where it, in, the, in the tabernacle there. And he says, but I want you to go back, and, um, and they're going to be his spies. Yeah, which you'll see. I, yeah. I forget what chapter. Uh, Hushai saves David's life <laughs> later yeah, on. Pretty much. Yeah. So David hears of Ahithophel's Hith- defection, and he prays God to turn his counsel on him. which to is foolishness. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Which, I, which is why I thought it was a big deal for him. Yeah. Because he must have been very wise. Yeah. And then he sends this. Well, he is. Well, we'll see. No, he gives the right advice. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see that in a few chapters. But yeah. So he sends Hushai, or how do you say that? Hushai. Hushai back. I think. And he says, you know, you go and tell us anything you hear. Act like you're, act like you're for Absalom and give him counsel and try to turn the counsel of Ahithophel. Uh, and, and he does later. That's what, they, that's what happens. So we get to 16. We get Tuesday. Uh, S- David meets Ziba, who is the uh, servant. or Pretty much the caretaker, the caretaker of Mephibosheth's caretaker. land. Yeah. So he claims to David that Mephibosheth has joined Absalom and has betrayed yeah. David. Claims it. Yeah. So he's out of the city. He's on his way with the king. Yeah. Yeah. And he brings gifts and everything. Yeah. Uh, and then we see Shimei come into a relative of Shim- Shimei. 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 <laughs> Shimei. 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 You don't even know what that. That's from an old show. Okay. He's a relative of Saul, and he comes and starts cursing and throwing rocks at David and his men. And he he's apparently really annoying. <laughs> I don't know why I get caught up on this, but verse nine, oh, you see is... Abishai. Uh, he, he doesn't like Shammai, and he's like, "Why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king?" And he wants to kill him, but David shows his leadership, and he and, just keeps following him, yeah. throwing rocks and <laughs> just cussing <laughs> at him. And <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. from John, from Saul's household, and he views it as if this is from God, so be it. And uh, <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, that's funny. Yeah. So Absalom finally enters into Jerusalem. And Hashai falsely pleads his allegiance, and he buys it. He does. Um, and Ahithophel gives him vulgar counsel and tells him to go sleep with all of the king's On top of David's house. Yeah, 
in a out, tent on top of out the in the house. open so people see it and uh, that fulfills uh, the prophecy in first samuel 12 11 uh, yeah. that that was going to happen so and then we get into the political or bureaucratic battle here yeah. or whatever, whatever he's yeah this is the council to absalom yeah. this is the whole this determines yeah. what happens. So Ahithophel actually gives the right advice here. Yeah, I and think says, so, yeah, yeah. Hey, David is vulnerable. Let's go get him right now. Uh, and as we see, he was vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Absalom wants to hear what Hushai has to say, and he gives the wrong advice. Gives the complete to, opposite. Uh, he should, hey, wait, wait until they... They're moving, or I forget yeah, he's exactly. He's a sneak. You know, he's used to this. Him and yeah, his mighty men. Yeah, he keeps saying, "Your not, dad is a mighty man of valor." Yeah, they're not. Why they're not going to be hiding with the rest of the people. They're going to be in some pit or some cave, and you'll never find them. Yeah, they're never going to be in a weak yeah. spot. So we we'll, we should wait so we can b- pull our troops together and really go attack him. Yeah, giving him, David time, time to to get away. Yeah, yeah. and Absalom takes the bait. Yeah, he and, does. Well, he does it in a way too that um, he he plays on Absalom's pride in verses five through fourteen. There, uh, you know, basically, you know, oh, you can really wipe him out. You know, you, you can be in this battle, and you know, so mm-hmm. he takes the bait and uh, he falls for it. Yeah, and all of the elders do too. So yeah, yeah. So then we see Hushai. He sends word to David through Jonathan and uh, Himahaz. Yeah, and you see that whole encounter where the woman hides them in the well, and, and yeah, that was like cool. That. That, right. You can just see that in your head. They're hiding from the spies. Yeah. Like, get down the whole and, time I'm thinking get, of a TV. Series. Yeah, getting down in a yeah. well, and she covers it up and puts some stuff over it like it's not there, and they wait to. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And then Ahithophel sees his counsel is not taken, and he sees the writing on the wall. Yeah, and he kills himself. Yeah, yeah, and David flees. Uh, he gets across the Jordan, and we, men, we see these three men that are loyal to the king, older gentlemen mostly, um, and they bring food and refreshments uh, to, to the king and to his people. One of them, uh, we're going to see him a little bit later. We're going to see some details about this man. So that's, uh, that's chapter 17. Yeah, 18. Uh, David... He, he's now ready for battle now that he's got the word from Hushai. And uh, he sets an army with Joab, Abishai, Joab's brother, and Atai as the captains of yeah. the army. So now, what you, this all happens in like two chapters. I mean, some of this other stuff we read in the Bible, it's like chapter after chapter, you know, like 10 chapters on one day, you know, <laughs> on pens and stuff yeah. like And yet, <laughs> and all these dude, And here we have all this activity and it's amazing so much that goes yeah on. it's amazing to me from the word of god the uh you know the ability to say it concisely because mm. i don't i typically We're don't not. have that as often as i'd like you know there's this economy of words that god uses and it still just paints the picture in so yeah. much detail yeah yeah so you know earlier chapters you get the feeling that Day, you get the feeling David's nearly by himself with just his court and his mighty men. But here we see... No, he's got an army. He's got thousands yeah. of people that are following these generals. That That's interesting. Yeah, so he splits them in thirds. Yeah, and then they, they're they going into battle against uh, Absalom, and David tells everybody, in front of everybody, he yeah, tells these guys... Verse 5, yep. ...to deal with him gently, basically not to kill his yeah. son. Keep Absalom alive. Everyone yeah. hears this. And it even stresses that everyone heard this. Yeah. Um, so they go into battle. David's men win the battle. Which is wisely done in the woods. Did yeah, you I was that? about to ask you that. Yeah. In verse 8 it says that the forest took more people than the sword. Yeah. So he shrewdly has them in this in the woods to where... You know, they're, if you're on horse or if you're getting chased, oh, okay. it, you know, you're getting, you know, think of like Return Return of the Jedi when they're, you know, they're taking those the th- things through the trees and uh, boom, they hit a tree, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And yeah, so 20,000 people were killed. You have the big swinging, the big swinging tree. Yeah, yeah, that would have been cool. <laughs> so here, Absalom's vanity <laughs> winds up being his end. And he's riding on a mule. How fast do a 
I'm thinking a guy on a horse and a guy on a mule, and I'm like, how are you going to survive anyway on a mule? But nonetheless. It was a fast uh, mule. I guess. Uh, verses 9 through 17, his hair, he's going along and. Gets caught in an oak tree. And the mule keeps going, and he's hanging there between heaven and earth. Yeah. And. Um, that paints the picture. That was a cool script. Yeah, the way that describes that. that. And so Joab sees it. Well, somebody says, yeah, somebody tells him, hey, this guy's over here, and he's... What, why do you think he killed... So he winds up killing him. He puts three darts through his chest. Uh, why do you think he, he killed Absalom? Any... I think... I, I want to do a deeper study on Joab myself, on just the character. Cause, he's an interesting guy. Because he's so loyal, which I think is part of why he killed him, but also he, like, like you've been saying, he... He's out he, for himself, too. He's out for himself in his position as David's head guy. So I think it was a little bit of both. Yeah, I think there there might be a little bit of anger because we just read he was the one that helped bring him back mm. from his grandfather and put his neck out, and now yeah. we see this. So I think there's a little bit of he's hacked off as well. Oh, dude. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, he, so he's killed. And they, the, they brutally kill him. Uh, yeah, he puts the the arrow darts through his chest, and then he s- tells his other guys finish him off. Yeah, and they do, and that's the third child that David has that is that is lost. Oh. Then the whole uh, we spend we won't spend much time here, but Ahimaaz wants to go tell David. He doesn't know the full story, so he sends Cushy. Ahimaaz is faster. He tells David not the whole story. Then Cushy comes up and says. Yeah, Absalom's the, dead, and then David goes into mourning there. Yeah. And I just, it's a weird. It's a yeah, it's a weird little situation. And there, there, you know, is it is it is it loss? I, I like to know what's going through David's head there because he is in turmoil. Like, is it yeah? Is it just the loss of a child? Or obviously, that's part of all of these. Is it remorse for not being the father that he? Probably should have been. I think it's a whole. I think his emotions are just. Is it out regret? Of life. You know what? What is this? Uh, we don't know. All of the above. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Also, uh, this guy who's wanting to make himself king, uh, they put him in a pit and just cover him with rocks. We don't hear anything else. Yeah, of that's how it. he's buried. That's that's it mm-hmm. forever. Now we are into Wednesday, which we got nineteen through twenty-one here. It goes quicker from here. Yeah. Uh, so we got 19 through 20. 19 pretty much is v- the the title on mine is Victory t- Turned to Mourning. So David mourning about his son's death, which then turns to all, all the people starting to mourn over his death. So yeah. they just had this He's, great victory, but Absalom died. And then you see Joab's response to... Yeah, he saves the kingdom here, actually. Yeah, he comes in and lets David have it. He's... He asked him, well, would you rather have us lose the battle and all of us die and have Absalom alive or win this battle and have your son yeah. die? If you don't get out there soon, it's going to be worse for you than if you, you had never, you know, all the things that have ever happened in yeah. your life. So get up and go and talk yeah. to the people. Oh, my son, Absalom. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And then he finally does. He, uh, he goes out into the gate and the people see him and, you know. Yeah. About. So then he goes in verses 9 through 14. Um, what do the tribes do now? I mean, they've all put their weight behind Absalom. He's shown himself to be, you know, not up to the task and killed. So what do they do? Yeah. Do you bring the king back? He's obviously got the army behind him. And they, so, they disagree on it. Israel yeah. and Judah here, right? And, and well... Somewhat. Is that later on? That's that's a little bit later on, and he, David, does something that's very interesting. Uh, Joab just won this battle for him. Joab just got him to straighten this out, and he sees the, you know, how long is it going to be till you bring me back? And then he 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 makes this statement, acknowledging, how do you say it? Amasa, Amasa, Amasa. Amasa third try didn't even get it um he makes a mesa who just lost the battle and was the general for for absalom he makes him captain of the guard in joab's place 
<laughs> I think that went well. Yeah, well, we'll see how that goes. And that sort of that and a couple other things that says, uh, this bowed the heart of all the men of Judah. So they decide to bring him back. And now we see person after person. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. So uh, your favorite guy. Shemai. Yeah. yeah. And Abishai wants to kill him again. <laughs> yeah, verses some, 16 through 23. There was some beef there. <laughs> Yeah, he doesn't. He he doesn't kill him. He does. Yeah, David doesn't allow him again. Yeah, he's like on a you know a day like this, we're not gonna have bloodshed. This is yeah. And then mm-hmm. uh, verses twenty four through thirty. Now this is interesting, and I don't think uh, I'll get your opinion on this. Uh, Mephibosheth shows up, and he hasn't shaved, and it looks like he probably hasn't changed his clothes or or it's done anything. He hasn't washed. Yeah, since yeah. the king king left, sort of as a sign to the king, hey. Uh, this wasn't my doing. Man. Ziba said he was going to get the, the donkey ready for me, and the next thing I know, he's gone. And Well, he was lame, so right. it does, yeah. And all the things he's saying uh, appear to be true. I get the feeling that... D- David doesn't fully believe him? Yeah, because he doesn't take everything from Ziba and give it to Mephibosheth again. He splits it in two, so eh, he's Do I believe you? Do I not? Yeah. Yeah. Because if he didn't believe Ziba, Ziba, if Ziba actually did that, he should have been dead. Yeah. But he doesn't really know. So I don't know. We'll let you decide because we don't know. And then there's an, then we meet this guy named Barzillai. And um, if you were here when Dr. Phillips was here, he preached an entire sermon on Barzillai. And just hearing his (laughs) British accent say it was really cool. But, uh, Barzillai was one of the guys that helped David with the food, and when he first arrived, he's an older man. He's come to say bye to the king, and the king says, "Come with me. I'm going to put you in the. T- I'm going to put you in the, in the palace, and we'll take care of you the rest of your life. You'll be part of my court there." And he says, "I'm too old. Let me stay here. Let me die with my people. Here, take my son, and you take him, and and have him go go with you." Uh, we find out he's his son in First Kings chapter. Two verse seven. We don't find it here, yeah. but uh, uh, and he does. Mm-hmm. So and then uh, you, and then you see the Israel and yeah. Judah quarrel of what to do with with David. Yeah, Judah and the ten tribes, uh, verses forty through thir- forty three. They're arguing over really who's more loyal to King David to bring him back, and uh, kind of well, sets the stage, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This sort of sets the stage for. Uh, not so much with Solomon, but, but with Rehoboam uh, later on. This is sort of the beginning. We see the cracks between the, the different tribes, especially Judah and ten, the ten northern tribes. Yeah. Then we go into another Benjamite. Do you have anything else in 19? No. Nope. We got another Benjamite named Sheba. Yeah. And he, he starts gaining... That was like the name of every dog. Sheba? When I was a kid. Everybody, what's your dog's name? Sheba. It was always Sheba. I think there's even a dog food or a cat food named that. I would have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> We're not cat people. Sorry if you are. Or dog. He uh, literally, I'm allergic to both. Yeah. So. He swells up. And he has to take not a, breathe. Until not I breathe. Get yeah, yeah. Him and, him and Brother Rick. So he starts gaining following from the man of Israel. So another yeah. person, Sheba, is trying to overthrow David again. He sees the opportunity here, and he, he tries to pounce on it. And you see David returns to his house yeah. in Jerusalem, um, and he sets his concubines in a ward. Yeah, they're, uh, well, I mean, they just slept with Absalom. That's gross. And, and, and so. They were widows the rest of their lives. Right. So I, I thought that was interesting. Uh, and then he asks Amasa, so the guy He's who. He's the new he, captain of the guard. Yeah, to gather all the men of Judah in three days. Yeah. And he wants to take care of this quick. He can't let this build up yeah. like what happened with Absalom, so he's doing this quick. And he doesn't do that. He doesn't come back within a lot of time. So then you go into Joab. Uh, yeah. David sends forces to go take out Sheba. But he doesn't He doesn't send Joab. No, Who's he, he send? He sends uh, Abishai. Yeah, his yeah. brother. Yeah, so, so another just Amasa is apparently just not up to the job. I mean, he, he lost yeah. the battle before. Now he's given the instruction to get in the army, and he failed. He, he fails that too. So Abishai and Joab are heading out with the troops, and he joins them. You want to tell it, or you want me to? <laughs> you can go ahead. Joab's a wild man. Yeah. Right. So he's lost his power, and he wants it back. So he 
he he drops his sword on the ground so to appear like he's unarmed and he goes over and he leans into him and grabs his beard which apparently uh was a greeting yeah it was a a typical type greeting and when he does that he stabs him under the fifth under rib. the fifth rib and apparently he like partly disembowels him and leaves him on the ground wallowing around half disemboweled with blood pouring out of him on and he's highway. not dead i mean yeah. that's the whole so <laughs> uh Joab's not messing around, and he no. wants his he wants his power back. And we see he, he by the end of this chapter he does he's yeah. back to the captain of the guard. Um, then he just throws a blanket over him or something over him. Yeah, and the they drag him out into a field and yeah. leave him there. So, so they, then go ahead. So then we get to they find Sheba. They they go around and search for him, and they find him in Abel. Yeah. And they start breaking down the wall until this wise woman comes out and yeah. says, if I give you the head of Sheba, will you stop? And and Joab agrees to it. Sure. She goes and cuts the dude's head off and throws it yeah. over, yeah. and then Joab stops the thing. The people, yeah. <laughs> the cow wild. gets flung over the wall. and Yeah. yeah. If you know that reference, you'll understand. <laughs> all right. So uh, that, yes. At the end here, you see that Joab and all the different guys, David's leaders there with yeah. With Zadok and everything. Then we get to 21. Now, this is just an... These are sort of like stories, little individual stories... That happen. At the end of David's kingdom. And this one's odd. Uh, the It's about Three the... year famine? Yeah. All because of the Gibeonites. If you go all the way back to Joshua chapter 9, we meet the Gibeonites for the first time. They're, They're the ones that tricked them, right? They tricked them, acted like they were from a far land, and they they made a league with them that they would they wouldn't destroy them, and come to find out they're their neighbors. Yeah. Well, apparently Saul in his escapades escapades sure that's a good word for that. He thank you. He ki- <laughs> <laughs> he kills some of the Gibeonites, and you know they broke the vow. So God, it's, it's so odd. I mean, this is now. Four, nearly 40 years later yeah and God finally is like okay this is the time and they have uh there's shed blood there's there that needs to be paid for and the Gibeonites are allowed to ask for what they want and they say we want seven of Saul's descendants seven men to be hung uh, now, who did they who did he pick <laughs> I didn't even realize this till and I think it's the same lady but Mephibosheth first, he's spared because David's made that vow to Jonathan. Mm-hmm. To, so I, the handmaid, Rizpah, two of her sons, and then five of, Michal. of Michal's sons. I guess when she was married to that guy while David was, was hiding. Yeah. That's, that's tough. It's brutal. Oh, that is unbelievable. Yeah. So uh, there's a whole thing about what Rizpah does. And then eventually David takes, he goes, he gets the bones of Saul and Jonathan and the bones of these men, and he puts them in the family grave of Kish, and the famine ends. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, go ahead. It, well, it says in verse 15, David was wax faint. So he's, you can see him losing his, it, it, it says that he's losing. And then you see these battles. And it says here, the sons of the giant, okay? That's Goliath's mom. Okay. So, D- David kills or Goliath. Da- yeah, right. David kills Goliath, and then you see them kill three or four more here. Right. David he kills- had four brothers. Okay. Yeah. It tells us, kill you, you go back to the story of David and Goliath, we know there were five of them. Okay. And uh, All of them die here. Is it remember. all of them? I didn't read how many of them. These four were born to the giant and Gad. Oh, and fell yeah. By the so, hand all of five of them. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting here, yeah, David is now sort of forced to retire from battle because Abishai has to save his life. He's the, the Philistines start attacking, and he nearly dies in battle, and they're like, hey, you're too old, and if you do this, the light of, you know, the light of Israel will go out. Yeah. You know, he's the king. And, he's, um, and these other guys take care of him. Like, yeah. they take care of the other giants. Right. Yeah. Well, the, what's the cool part about that is until David, 
Nobody, Nobody was willing even to stand up. Yeah. And now he has got shown dudes. his courage and his example has emboldened others. Uh, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, uh, you, you don't even probably think this way, but when I was a kid, you know, it was a big deal that someone broke the four-minute mile. Oh, yeah. Now. It happens all the time. Oh, it's not even. Now they're trying to go for under two hours in a marathon. Yeah, I mean, if you if you don't break the four-minute mile, you're not even qualifying for for the Olympics. I mean, that's just amazing. And, yeah. You know, this is the kind of zeal that he, he gave these men. Yeah. And it's that way with everything in our life. You know, if you want to, somebody needs to be faithful and to put their faith in God and people will follow after that person. Just uh, takes one. Yeah, it takes one. Will you be the one? <laughs> I like how in verse 20, it says that the man was great in stature and had Every hand six <laughs> fingers and every foot six toes. <laughs> I'm I'm assuming that's like figurative speech of how big these dudes were. No, I think the dude actually, had, actually had. I think the dude actually had twenty four <laughs> digits. I okay. No, I think that's that's real. There was a king. I, was, I just well, thought I mean, it was like figurative lang- no, language. No, when I was studying this, there's some king in the 1600s that was the exact same thing. I don't know if he was tall, but he had. Okay. He had. All right. 24 just, digits between his like, hands and his feet. That's figurative speech. Uh, nope. If it was figurative, that's a good way of saying, man, this guy was big. And could he play the piano? <laughs> <laughs> he, could do two, he could do two octaves his, with one hand. <laughs> his balance must have been crazy. <laughs> All right, now into Thursday, which we got the last three chapters of Second Samuel. We got 22 through 24. <laughs> I'm and just thinking all the things. A guy could do with it. You got to get extra wide shoes. Yeah. You always have a toe hanging out of your what sandal. Is double E or whatever that is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your sandals. Yeah, yeah. that would have been. Always stubbing your toe. Couldn't hide in the sand, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knew where he was. All right, what were we doing? 22. <laughs> we have the song of David's, uh, the David's song of praise, yeah. deliverance, judgment, mercy, strength, vengeance. Uh, it's pretty much, I saw that it was ident- almost identical to Psalm 18. It's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. it just reflects David's gratitude and faith yeah. in God through here. And Yeah, the cool thing is here, all the credit is given to God. Yeah. He, he, fully under, he is fully aware that his, his life is, is because of what God's done in there. Yeah, if you look at how David's life went, he was well, like, as... Relative to how close he was with God, you can see it going. And now, right, he's he's close, right. giving everything to to God. I just, but he, he's always trusted in God. Yeah, right. So that's always the focus of his life. So that, eh, that's great. Yeah, praise for deliverance is uh, praise for God's deliverance is what I put as the title here. Chapter twenty three. Uh, cool chapter. Starts off with David's final word or last words of David. Uh, po- I, I don't think it was as like his deathbed. I think yeah. it was more like poetically. These are well, yeah, the it, last phrases that he recorded. A poetic yeah. reflection of his go. life and reign. <laughs> That's how poetic that was. <laughs> that was. You uh, said it in that voice. He speaks of his covenant with God here. Uh, even, and he says, even though his house is, was not following in his footsteps, God still promises if they follow that he will. Yeah. And then for me, I think... The rest of the chapter here is like a nostalgic remembrance of yeah. David's guys. And, These guys deserve credit. Man. They stuck with him. I mean, they were with him from the time he was hiding from King Saul till now. I mean, the, those that hadn't died yet, I mean, they, they deserve to be, you know, well, the Lord thinks they deserve to be remembered. Yeah. And, and he had some bad dudes with yeah, him. Yeah, these guys are cool as could be. Yeah, and... He, I, they did some crazy stuff, like fighting off 800 dudes and 800 enemies and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, and they all had different different characteristics that David needed in, in his men. Uh, yeah, some of them were probably stronger and tougher than David, but yet, you know, God chose David and gave him the people he needed. And yeah. We see that in the church. You know, it tells us to pray for laborers in the harvest. Because uh, that's what we need, and we need people with different skills and and things like that. Yeah, like the first one, a dino, the Esnite, he lift up his spear against eight hundred, uh, who he slew at one time. It says. Yeah. And then you have Eleazar, 
uh, or the son of Dodo, and he he fought three hundred guys. It's just, yeah, you're talking about yeah, <laughs> the guy fighting stuff. for people in the middle of a field of lentils and all kinds of stuff. The cool part is, uh, in verses thirteen through seventeen, uh, he's going back to the days of Adullam when he's there. Yeah, and he tell the story about him. He's just talking, and he says, "Man." I wish I had some water from that well in Bethlehem where I, you know, where I grew up. And three of the guys, he doesn't tell them to. Three of the guys are like, "Okay, we're gonna do it." <laughs> and they do. They fight through the forces and the uh, the other enemy, and um, and they bring the, the water, water back to him. And then he's like, he's he doesn't drink the water. He pours it out in honor of, of their the self sacrifice. Yeah. He's like, I can't do this. This is basically this could have cost your life. And um, uh, we would be the opposite of that. I would think, in my mind, I would be in honor of your thing. I would definitely yeah. do this, but they're, they're the opposite thing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Whoop. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just, it seems odd, but th- that's the th- the thinking here. My mind goes to Band of Brothers. There's this guy who is a man- like a maniac, mm-hmm. and he... He had. They're surrounding a city, and you have. They had to go and tell the the squad on the other side about like the plan or whatever. And their radios were out, so he ran right by tanks and all of the Germans, <laughs> and goes and tells them. And then he comes back and just running. <laughs> he's just running. He's a madman, and that's what I think about when I hear. Is it a true story? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, Band of Brothers. It was the. What's that? Nineteen. 19- 17 17 yeah, yeah. That, i mean that guy's running yeah, running running, running. Yeah, yeah same thing and in the band in the in the tv show that he, you see the germans like what in the, like should we shoot this guy <laughs> <laughs> so i think about that no, he got a hall pass yeah. uh, now notice who I, I don't want to spend too much time but notice who's not mentioned here you said this to me before we started here i had never noticed that joab is only mentioned when it's talking about his brothers it does not talk about Joab and his victories and stuff like yeah, that. I, I don't know. So I've, it's interesting. Uh, also interesting is the last verse mentioning Uriah, the Hittite, as one of his mighty men. Um, that's interesting. Yeah, because you very, killed him. Yeah, the very guy he had killed. So, yeah. Last chapter. Yes. Second Samuel. Second Samuel. We have David doing something, a very prideful thing here. Yeah, the and sin of the census. Yeah, and he wants to know how big the nation is. And... Joab is the guy who tells him it's a bad idea. It's a bad idea, but he, the king's the king's voice overrules him, and he he goes and does it anyway. And you see the census of Israel at this point. There's an interesting phrase here, and again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, "Go number Israel and Judah." If you go into First Chronicles twenty one one, it tells us that Satan tempted David. So the he uh, must be here, Satan, or God allowing Satan to do this. Uh, mm. So that's interesting. But the issue here is, was acting, uh, was David was acting like the people were his. That's the issue here. You only count things that are yours. And Israel are God's people, yeah. not David's. And yeah, the minute, uh, the minute this happens... He is convicted, it tells us, in verses 10 through 14. Yeah, you see that there's eight, he, it, he gets word that there's 800,000 in Israel and 500,000 in Judah. And like you said, right when he hears that, he, he's convicted. Yeah. And there's some things, when we, get to, uh, when we get to Chronicles, we'll talk about that. The numbers are different here, but there's a reason the numbers are different. We'll go into that at a, uh, yeah. when we get to Chronicles. So the prophet of Gad comes to David and gives him the option of three punishments for his sin here. It's interesting that God does that. Yeah, three years of famine, and it it says seven here, but in First Chronicles it says three, and or three months of fleeing from enemies, or three three days of plague, and David chooses the three days of plague, and seventy thousand people die. Yeah, he picks the plagues because he's like, I'd rather fall into the hands of God than in the hands of my enemies. Yeah. So that's what he does there. Then uh, I thought it was interesting with the account of the angel of the Lord ready to destroy the city. David, after seeing the angel, it says, uh, 
David, God stops him, stops the angel, and David repents again for his sin. Yeah. And so. And he goes and to, makes a sacrifice. Now, this yeah. is interesting. Uh, this is something to mark in your Bible, uh, actually. In verses 15 through 25, David goes and he buys the threshing floor of, of this man, and he builds an altar there. He does a burnt, he does a burnt offering, a sin offering here, and he does a peace offering, fellowship. Now, so that's, you know, for his sin, for fellowship. Here's the interesting part. This threshing floor had a history where it is, and it will have a future as well. Uh, in Genesis 22, 2, Mount Moriah, this same area is where Abraham was told to go and sacrifice Isaac. So this is it. And then in 1 Chronicles 21, this is where Solomon will build the temple. Uh, we're told in 2 Chronicles 3.1 that that's called Mount Moriah. And on those same hills, not the specific, but in those same hills, this is where Jesus Christ will be crucified as well. So this is the, the hub, the area where you know God will provide himself a lamb. Yes, he will this exact spot, and the perfect Lamb of God will, will be slain there. Uh, why it's all in the same location, I don't know. That's just what God's chosen to do. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, and you see that that stops the plague. When yeah, he, yeah. When he and it connects Abraham, it connects David, it connects Jesus Christ. Yep. Yeah. Friday is the next day. All right, we find ourselves in First Kings, finally. The first two chapters here, and chapter one is jam-packed. Yeah, and then it, it's a then long it's, one too. Then the rest aren't that much. Uh, so, uh, First Kings uh, goes from the death of King David all the way to the prophet Elijah. So that's what we're going to see here. There's yeah. tons of stuff in there, but we'll and get to those. It starts with David's power weaning. He's dying, and uh, they get a get him a handmaid named a- Abishag. That's a little weird. Like he can't keep heat, so they're like, "Oh, we're going to find this beautiful young lady, and she's going to." Keep Lay in warm. the bed with you to keep warm. Uh, I looked up. They said that was a common custom. I don't know. But the king knew or not. So. Yeah, he didn't have any relations with her or anything like that. She might have been considered one of his concubines. It doesn't say that, but what we see happen later might tend, tend to that. So Adonijah, Absalom's brother... Uh, then exalts himself as the next king. Yeah, because it's obvious the king's about ready to die. Yeah. Uh, so the successor needs to be found. And Adonijah, who is Absalom's brother, uh, he is the fourth of David's kids. Uh, Amnon and Absalom are already dead. And what's his, uh, the third brother, uh, what is his name? Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm trying to find it in my notes here. Uh, he... We don't know where he is. I don't know if he... Chiliab is his name. But nonetheless, Adonijah decides to exalt himself. And who goes with him? Joab. And Abiathar the priest. And Solomon, Nathan, and Benaiah are not invited. Yes. Zadok is not... All of those guys are specifically not invited to go to this thing. Which means he probably had intentions of doing away with Solomon. Yeah. Um, Yeah. He didn't want someone who's rightful to the throne there. So Nathan, uh, the prophet, goes to Bathsheba and creates this plan to uh, to go to David and have Solomon anointed. Uh, and so Bathsheba comes in and says, David, you made an oath with, with me that Solomon would be the next king. Nathan comes in after her and confirms this. She comes in again and she says, Sol- and he said, David says Solomon will be the next king. Was that fabricated? I don't know. You've got some interesting stuff here. Adonijah, Joab, Abithar, none of them talk to the king. What, who do you want as the successor? None of them. So there's sort of a thought in my mind that they knew he wasn't. And this is who, you know, Joab wants to keep power. So he's putting himself out there uh, to... Support Adonijah. The, but your first reading, you're like, Nathan and Bathsheba are like, you do Conspiring, this, then yeah. I'll do this, then you do this. Yeah. So it sort of has this feel. But as you as you see David's response, is he an old man that's just, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what you said? Or 
you know, we read in we read in First Chronicles that he he had given the plans for the temple to Solomon. So, had they actually spoken about? I think they had. I I, I think Solomon was the rightful heir. Yeah, uh, David doesn't speak like someone that's been duped in here. And yeah. In the next chapter, you see David is speaking with yeah. with his mind. Right. He's older, but he's not he's yeah. not out of it. Nathan was also the prophet of God. I mean, that has to have some weight here that he was reliable. Uh, it's just an ambiguous. Uh, yeah, it it's a little. Say. It's a look. It looks weird. But, yeah. uh, Thirty-one yeah. through forty, they quickly uh, crown Solomon, and he he rides in on the king's mule. He sits on the king's throne, and forty-one through fifty-three are interesting reading. So yeah, I, so he, uh, uh, Joab hears the noise over there. Yeah, and is like, Adonijah, all of them. Yeah. yeah, what's going on down the street? Pretty much. And they they go to inspect what's going on. Yeah, Abiathar's see. son comes and tells them, "Hey, they just crowned Solomon as king," and everyone scatters. Mm-hmm. This whole celebration, I'm the new king, and hey, there's nobody around yeah. here. They see Solomon sitting on the throne too. It yeah. That, so. so he goes and does something interesting. Uh, Adonijah does. He goes into the tabernacle. There's no temple yet. He goes into the tabernacle and he grabs the horns of the altar. And I, when I was studying that, it looks like that was sort of like an ancient times, not in the Word of God, but in ancient times, that was sort of a place of sanctuary. Like, you can't do anything to me. I, I'm on base yeah. <laughs> type, type situation. Can't tag me. Yeah. Um, and Solomon tells him, you know, you can live if you... Show yourself worthy. Show yourself worthy. And he bows, acknowledging his brother as king. What a day that man had. I'm king. <laughs> And I just I'm had bleeding to for my life. Swallow my pride, and yeah, exactly. Chapter two, uh, uh, we see David's advice to Solomon here. Are you? Is there yeah, more? No, no, this is the oddest chapter, one of the oddest chapters in the Bible for me. Yeah, it, it starts off with David, David saying, "Show thyself a man. Yeah. Keep the charge of the Lord." Keep Verse, it, yeah, verses one through four reminds him of the covenant and. As long as you follow the Lord, the Lord promised to keep keep his line safe. Uh, and then... Then unfinished business on David's part. Yeah. David, all these times we were saying, no, no, don't kill him. No, 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 don't kill him. You know, don't do this, don't do this, you know. Uh, and he's always, you know, this is a day of rejoicing. Don't kill him, that kind of thing. And now he's got three guys that he wants stuff done. Uh, Joab, don't let him, don't let him die a natural death. He needs to, he's, his treachery, he needs to die for. Let not his whorehead go down to the grave in peace. Barzillai, he tells him to lift his family up for the kindness. Mm -hmm. And then Shimei, 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 (laughs) I've heard it Shimei, but either way, um, he, he's going to die. And, uh, he tells, he's like, you do whatever you want. But he calls him a wise man here. It's the first time yeah. that Solomon's called wiser. And then, verses 10 11, King David dies. Now, we keep saying he's an older man. He's only 70 years, 70 ish years old. So don't take offense if you're near that age watching this. But, you know, he if, was 40 years as king. This guy lived a tough life. This isn't like 70 years living in. Ohio. This he lived is, in caves for half of his life. Yeah, he's lying on the ground. He's been in battle for, you know, at least fifty of those years of his life. He was out in the fields taking care of sheep. I mean, this man lived a tough life. Battling bears. He probably could barely move. You look at a like an NFL player after they've played for ten years. This guy's been doing that kind of battle for fifty years of his life. He probably couldn't touch his you know touch his hair it was because of his, his arms uh, you know so he think of it that way all right yeah. if that makes if that makes us feel better <laughs> makes me feel better um so the rest so, of the chapter is solomon establishing his kingdom after david's dead and you see him taking care of people yeah and all that unfinished business adonijah uh comes to bathsheba doesn't go to the king sneaky little dude goes to Bathsheba and he says uh, uh, ask the king if I could marry Abishag and Solomon sees straight through it 
you know, this is where I think she was probably a concubine because by marrying her, it would give him claim to some of David's throne. Yeah. And so David sees right through it. And he doesn't just exile him. He has him killed. By Beniah. Yeah. So this is the fourth child lost. You remember David's, he said that the back with the, the, the thing from Nathan with Uriah, you know, and he says his own sentence that it would be fourfold, and here's the fourth here's child the fourth lost. One. Yeah. The uh, next one is Ab- Abiathar he's, being banished. Yeah, which this fulfills prophecy also. Uh, back in 1 Samuel 2, when Eli is told that his family won't stay as the, as the high priest, this is the last one, and Zadok now takes his place. The next one is Joab, and he tries the same thing as uh, uh, Adonijah, right? Yeah. Yeah. And he tries the whole horn thing in the in the tabernacle, but uh, he has him. Solomon has him killed. Yeah. Notice there, he says for the the treachery, he mentions two. He mentions Abner and um, and Amasa. He does not mention Absalom from killing Absalom. Just those two. Mm. So. I don't know, did David see? This is just an odd dynamic with with David, though. Um, You know, he acknowledges his loyalty, but yet judgment for his treachery had to come. Yeah. And we see that. And And he he takes him, he kills him right there. Yeah, and like that the blood of all the guys he murdered to be on his head and his, yeah. And Beniah, yeah, he... Beniah's the guy, he's the henchman. Yeah, he's, he's the guy. And then your guy. Shimai. Shimmy. Shimmy Shimai. Uh, he, f- he found favor in Solomon's eyes and dwelt in Jerusalem for three years. But then he went to Gath with Achish still. And Solomon wasn't fond of that, and he kills him. Well, no, he had set, set him up, sort of. Oh, okay. So I he did. says, okay, you're not allowed to live where you live anymore. He goes, I want you to live in the city. And if you ever leave the city, oh, okay. you're dead. So he so, does. So three years later, his servants run off. So he goes off chase, chasing after him, and uh, you, I told you, you can't leave. And I guess who kills him? Yeah, Benaiah. Yeah. <laughs> so he deals with all of his potential enemies. This is the opposite of how his father did it. He does it swiftly. Yeah. Um, and at the end, it says, "And the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon." Yeah. So he. Very good. Saturday, First Kings three through five. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. F- Today is mostly going over the splendor, the wisdom, greatness of Solomon, yeah. and all that jazz. From here on out, it's well. From pretty, pretty. The quick. next few chapters, it's yeah. pretty quick because it just goes over Solomon being following a the lot Lord. of detail. But yeah, it's yeah. not a lot of things you, like application. He makes a league with uh, Egypt, marrying his daughter, which is going to come back back to bite him. Uh, this was a common practice, still is today. You you know you marry the queen or the king or prince of another land and it gives you uh, commerce with them it gives you peace with them that kind of thing um then we get into solomon's dream which i lo- i have this entire dream highlighted uh with yeah it's famous with, yeah with solomon uh, god asked solomon what he wants and 6 through 15 you see solomon's humility and heart for god and he doesn't ask for riches or victory over his enemies or anything material he asked for wisdom. Yeah, an understanding heart to judge the people. Yeah. And, and then God... In verse 10, it says, the Lord was pleased by this. Mm-hmm. And so he gives him, makes him the wisest man on earth. Ever. Ever. And he also gives him what he did not ask for with riches, riches. and honor and that no king will be like him. During his life. During his life. Right, yeah. And, uh, and God... Gives him a promise that if he walks in his ways, his his life will he'll he'll live a long time. And then uh, then God shows an example of his wisdom, <laughs> and he has the two harlots come to him. Uh, the both had had babies within three days of each other. <laughs> yeah, and the one lady she smothered her baby to death, so she goes and takes the other lady's baby. And, and puts the other baby in hers. Yeah, this is a famous account. Most people probably heard this, you know, and. But, he, Go ahead, finish it up. Yeah, so they come and they're arguing. Well, it, well, the lady who had the living baby but now has the dead baby is like, that's not my baby. Sure. <laughs> and so they're arguing about who who's the mother of the living one, and Solomon says, all right, 
give me a sword. <laughs> I'll cut it in half, you'll get half of it. And uh, you have two different responses here. You have the living, the mother with that, the true, the mother. true mother saying, okay, no, no, just let it live. I want it to live. The other one's yeah, like, no, t- neither of it. Let the baby. It li- <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. The dead mother, the, the dead baby's mother says, neither of us should have it. So yeah. Solomon knows who Through is the, the true mother. Yeah. And the so. wisdom made the people fear. Yeah. They realized God's hand was on them. Yeah. yeah. Pretty so cool. Then, then we get into uh, First Kings 4, uh, and then we see the establishment of his kingdom. Bunch of names uh, shows officers. Solomon's officers and 1 through 6. Then 7 through 19 shows he basically set up 12, 12 governors in the different tribes, taxing the land. Each month they had to fulfill the needs of, of the king. Uh, we see he lives, verses 20 through 23, quite a lavish lifestyle here. Um, one guy said gluttony was definitely on the uh, uh, in his life. Um, verses 23 th- through 28 talks about his territory, all the horses. Uh, he violates Deuteronomy 17:16, where it said, you know, it said, "Don't multiply horses, don't multiply wives, and don't have uh, tons of silver and gold." Well, God's allowing him to have riches, but he didn't have to buy horses. Forty thousand of them. Forty thousand of them. Yeah. So he violates this, and we're going to see he winds up violating all three of these. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it shares of his wisdom. Uh, he, you know, that everyone knew about it, all the nations. Yeah, yeah. Everyone around him knew that he was he was the guy. Uh, now, this part I find interesting. He had 3,000 Proverbs. I love the book of Proverbs. Uh, he had 1,500 songs. Uh, and they're talk, he basically is a man of science. He's talking botanical things, zoological. I mean, he was... He was the guy. Well, his wisdom let him see the pattern of the world yeah. that, that God created. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah, God made him... Wise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the word. Yeah. And, uh, and knowledgeable, too. So, yeah. uh, First Kings 5. Are we into Sunday? Nope. No. Nope? Okay. Still Saturday. And you see the preparations for the building of the temple. So, yeah. remember that David was not going to be the guy that he wanted to build the temple, but the yeah. Lord said that he was not going to. His but David was. made the plans. Yeah. And we see that. And he had already accumulated some of the items and gives it to Solomon. So he strikes a deal with Haram, the king of Tyre, and so that they will give them wood, cedar, and furs from Lebanon, and they'll give him wheat uh, and wheat and, and oil. Yeah. yeah. So then Solomon gets a bunch of workers. 30,000 people from Israel, uh, 30,000 men. They would go 10,000 of them at a time, and then they'd have two months off. So they would rotate. And then there's something like 150,000 that I guess they're slaves. Uh, 70,000 bear burdens, 80,000 were hewers, uh, and then there's 3,300 supervisors. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people doing this. That's yeah. a lot of people. Uh, but he uses, you know, the Canaanites probably under his rule and had put them to work. Yeah. I think it's in First Chronicles 28 with the instruction. We'll get into that later, but mm-hmm. I think that's where oh. you find the instructions. Yeah, I saw... Yeah, I didn't look that up. Yeah, for, I'll, I'll look that up. Either when twenty-two we get there. or twenty-eight, but we'll get to that at, okay. at some point. Sunday, we got the last two chapters of the week for us. We got six and seven. So six, we got the construction of the temple. Yeah, and this happens on the four hundred and eightieth year after leaving Egypt. Uh, a lot of people believe it took three years to cut down all the timber, so that probably started on because this. The temple foundation starts on the fourth year of, of his reign. So most likely this started year one of Solomon that he, he started this. Um, so that is, eight, I have it written down, First Chronicles 28. It is 28, 11 through 12. So uh, the verse that stuck out to me was verse 12, uh, a covenant reminder, kind of saying this isn't, the building isn't one that is should be important. It's following with your heart. Which is a big deal because later on they start to worship the temple almost as much as they worship. That meant more to them than their relationship with God. Yeah. Uh, I th- Verse 7 is the part that stuck out to me I thought was cool. No hammer or axe was on site. Everything was pre- prefabbed and slid into place uh, where this... 
you know, cool. now there's no, you know, we went at all this stuff when we were in Leviticus and Ex- Exodus and Leviticus on the, the typology of all these outside of the actual pieces of furniture, the same typology there, the construction of the building, the dimensions, none of that really has typology uh, in here uh, that I, that I see. The only thing I see is, you know, Christians, we are the temple of God. We are the habitation of God. So that's the only real thing I, I see there. Um, now, we end this chapter by showing that it took seven years to build the temple, and it was so magnificent. Uh, you know, like I said, the Israelites somewhat worshiped that. Then we get into uh, chapter 7, and we see Solomon build his own house. 13. 13 years. <laughs> so seven years to build the temple, 13 years to build his, and it looks quite grand. Uh, Costly stones. Yeah. Two pillars of brass, 10 bases of brass. Yeah. It's just You can read the details there. We're not yeah. going to get into them, but... And then he hires this guy, the same name as the king, uh, Hiram, this artist. He's half Gentile, half Jew, and he has him come and do all of the beautiful intricacies of the temple. Uh, the, 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 the last thing I have, verse 21, there's two main pillars in this. And every time you walk into the, the temple, you would see them. And the one is named Jashin, which means he shall establish, God shall establish. And the other one is Boaz in strength. He shall establish in strength. So every time a king, every time a person walked in there, they knew it was because of God, his strength that we were, they were established. Yeah. And uh, I think that's a big takeaway with these ver- with these chapters. Yeah, that's yeah, that's Solomon what I said. is was given the riches from the Lord and he's like the Lord all of this was because of the Lord. And he'll do well with this for a while. Yeah. And then he starts to go the way of the world. Yep. So start breaking the Deuteronomy 27. Yep. All right. So that's it for the week. It's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff. A lot of narrative there. Yeah. Next week we go through 2 Kings 3. So we'll get through uh, several of the kings and uh, get to Elijah. Elijah. Pretty cool. What's right, I, got a, I got a joke from uh, Ronald Roberto. Oh, okay. My uncle, he's got one for us. I keep getting texts from from I love it. It's from my Aunt Terry and my Uncle Ron. And <laughs> each Monday it's like one They've of the Laffy me. Taffies or I something. Guess, I, don't know. I love the it. Joke though. of the day. It's supplying me with jokes. Let's hear it. Did you know that ten plus ten and eleven plus eleven equal the same thing? Ten plus ten equals twenty. Eleven plus eleven equals twenty two. <laughs> That's terrible. It's really bad. <laughs> it is really bad. That one, yeah. But it's like the. It's the best when it makes you not would, want to hear it again. <laughs> why was six afraid? Because seven, eight, nine, yeah, or something, one, like, something like that. That's yeah. about that one. That was told in the middle school class yeah. last week. So. All right. Very good. Well, you guys have a great week. Stay in the Word of God, and uh, we will. We'll see you next week. Yep. All right. Bye. See ya.